Welcome back. We're here at our third and final uh, symposium here for the day for Microelectric Frontiers. My name is Terry Steele. Um, I'm a young faculty member here at Imperial Science and Engineering. And not like yourself, I was a student uh, a short while ago as well. So as a student, I know how right now you study reading a lot of books, reading a lot of pages. One of the great things about going into a career of science is soon that you see as you get into science that these names that you read in these textbooks, they suddenly come alive. You suddenly get to meet them. You get to learn from them and symposiums like this. This is what really makes a career in science a great benefit. So our next speaker is actually going to give us some history on the on the science and some Nobel Prizes and how they came. Our next speaker is going to be Professor Erling Norby. Um, currently, he works at the, the Center for the History at the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. He's vice chairman of the board of the J. Craig Venture Institute. I'm guessing he must spend a lot of time in the plane back and forth. Um, he's formerly professor of virology and chairman of the Karolinska Institute for 25 years. This is where he also got his MD and PhD. He's also, or was, deeply involved in the work on the Nobel Prizes in Physiology and Medicine, Chemistry, Physics, and has a heavy, recently published the book, Nobel Prizes and the Life Sciences. So we can welcome Professor Erling Norby. Yeah, so good afternoon. It's my great pleasure to address you and uh, to discuss with you uh, some, some very special aspect of immunology. Uh, I will take you on a much longer time journey than what you've had with the previous speakers. And uh, the Nobel Prizes, of which there are prizes in physics, in chemistry, physiology or medicine, they are the most prestigious prizes in the world. Why is that? The reason is that uh, they've been awarded for more than 100 years, that the work done by the committees and the prize-giving institutions has been very meticulous. So one has managed to identify the major discoveries, which actually is the key word in uh, Alfred Nobel's will. And by doing that, the Nobel Prizes describe the history of the advance of knowledge. And that's what I want to illustrate in this lecture. So we start actually, if I can get the first slide. We start already with the first Nobel Prize in physiology or medicine. And then it was known at that time that there was something called immunity. It was known since uh, way back in civilization that there were epidemics, even though I didn't know what was the cause of epidemics and that sometimes if there were repeated epidemics of the same kind that some people were immune and the word immune is taken from latin it was the rule that when roman soldiers returned back from the uh, the battle that they were tax exempted for a short time before they had to start to pay tax again and that was called immunity so uh, and this immunity was well known, but it wasn't known what was the mechanism. The first Nobel Prize to Emil von Behring, he had, there was a very severe disease called anthrax, quite common in those days, and he took material from this bacterium, which at that time could be propagated in the laboratory, thanks to Koch's contributions, and he immunized horses. And they took serum from these horses and treated patients and could prevent the very severe and life-threatening disease of diphtheria. This was an enormous advance. And uh, originally it, the material was called antitoxin because it worked against a toxin of the bacterium and later on called antibodies. And the terminology evolved also so that one called something that could lead to the production of antibodies, I call that antigen. And it was soon realized that this procedure when I prepared antibodies in an animal and then gave it to man, that that worked well, but it had some drawbacks. And it was much better to immunize man directly. 
And that's why we call, talk about passive immunization versus active immunization, which actually, uh, uh, in fact, is vaccination as we call it today. Still very little was known about this kind of mechanism. And the next Nobel Prize in immunology was eight years later. It was to Mechik Nikola, which is not in this picture, and to uh, Paul Ehrlich. And uh, I'll show this picture just to illustrate some essence of science, namely the dialogue, the debate, the discussion. And uh, Ehrlich here is the person with a little dog in his lap, so you can easily recognize who he is. And he's having a kind of intellectual fight with uh, uh, Arrhenius, Svante Arrhenius, who got the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1904 because Arrhenius wasn't really uh, convinced that, that Ehrlich was right. And he was a very opinionated person, actually had a lot of influence on the Nobel work in the early days. Uh, Ehrlich was thinking about the fact that there were different kinds of immunity, different, there was a diversity, and there were different specificities. And how could that be? And remember, at this time, essentially nothing was known about the chemical nature of the so-called antibodies. So he speculated that maybe some mechanism like, like a key in a lock, uh, that maybe in some way, when this new antigen came into the body, that could instruct the immune system to produce this lock. Uh, there was the instructive method for antibody production. Uh, not knowing the chemistry, or you are speculating lo loosely about side chains and things like that. But very little was known. Now, so we human beings are different, and we are different also with regard to uh, the character of our cells. And this can be simply illustrated by our blood groups. And those blood groups, as they were discovered, were very important because they could define who could give blood to whom. And very simply, there are two major antigens here on the surface of red cells, the A antigen or the B antigen. And you have all the different combinations, and this illustrates how someone, let's say, that has A uh, red blood cells can uh, receive blood from a person with the same uh, blood group, of course, and can receive blood from, from a person who has a so-called so -called zero blood group. Very simple system, but it illustrates that we are different. There's something called the self and something that is the non-self. The uh, uh, laureate who discovered this was Carl Landsteiner, originally from Austria. He did his work at Rockefeller Institute at that time. And uh, this was a, a very, very uh, clever scientist who did a gave a number of contributions, including the human blood groups. He also showed there is another system called the rhesus system, Rh plus and Rh minus, that's very important in relationship to pregnancies, repeated pregnancies, because the fetus in the female body is a foreign antigen. And amazingly, still today, we do not know by which mechanism a woman that is pregnant prevent her immune system from reacting against her fetus? That is still a critical question to answer. To answer. Uh, Lundstein did many other things also. He's one of the first to demonstrate that there are different branches of, of immunology, production of antibodies, but also cell-mediated immunity. McFarland Burnett is a virologist and a really a statesman of the science. When I started in virology in, in, in 59, uh, this was the hero of the field. I mean, he, he had a fantastic broad biological perspective on science, and he uh, was a very visionary person. But I'm not going to talk about his contributions as a virologist, but I'll, I'll mention one thing that was very important in my career since I'm talking to the young people here. And that is that when I was 23 years old, I was invited for a dinner to my mentor. And the guest of honor was McFarlane Burnett because this was December 8th. And you can imagine what an inspiration it was for someone who had just started in the field to meet uh, this kind of icon of the field. Now, Burnett was proposed many times over for, for his contribution to virology, and, and the proposal was that he should be recognized for this or that. And we have a term where you say he was declared priceworthy. 
But not everyone who's declared price worthy can get a price because remember, there's only the one price per year. So Bennett eventually didn't get a price for his contribution in virology, but he did get a price for a contribution in immunology. And this was all theory, theory building. And he was reflecting seriously about what does it mean that we are different, that there's a self and not self, and there must be a mechanism by which we can turn off the immune cells that potentially could react with our own body. And that we want to, to avoid, of course. And he uh, said that I think that sometime during the embryonic development, those immune cells that could attack the body, they are knocked out, they are eliminated. And therefore you become, as it's called, tolerant. And he did get the prize then for this concept of immunological tolerance, but he did not, when he tried to prove this experimentally, he failed. So there was someone else who could demonstrate what it was. One thing that influenced his thinking a lot was an observation had been made in the mid-40s of twin calves. Now, these are uh, non-identical twin calves. And if, if we in humans, if we have non-identical twins, then you retain each one the separate immunological characteristics, and that is it. But in calves, then the two twins, they share the placenta. So the blood is exchanged between the two. I mean, this just so happens in nature that, they, that in this case, it is that arrangement. And therefore, even though the two twins are different, each one is tolerant to the other one. And this was a very important biological observation. And very often, we can learn a lot from studies, phenomena in nature, and try to understand what they, what they mean. Uh, by way of digression, actually, Aldous Huxley, when he wrote Brave New World, he took advantage of an observation that farms had done a long time back. And that is, again, when you have a situation with a, a male fetus and a female fetus in a calf, then the hormones from the male fetus, they, can, they do get over to the female fetus, and actually that offspring will be not be fertile. It will be influenced by that hormone. And when Aldous Huxley wrote Brave New World, he uses this phenomenon. So the way of controlling the population was to inject female fetuses with male hormones and make them sterile for the rest of life so they could be good workers. But that was quite a digression. Now, uh, so the other prize recipient in 1960 was uh, Peter Medawar, uh, another fantastic biologist. He was interested during the Second World War in transplanting skin because there was all, a lot of war damage and you want to transplant skin. And then the experience was that, no, you can't move organs from one individual to the other. You, you, can, you can move it within the individual. And he wanted to understand why is this so? Why, why, what, what is the kind of reaction? Because at that time, it was not known. What, 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 why did one not accept foreign tissue? And he progressively built up the concept that this is in fact due to immunological phenomena. This was new for the time. And so he could see inflammation, and in particular he could see if you made repeated transplantation in the same individual of foreign tissue, the first tissue took some time to be rejected, but the second time you gave the tissue, it was promptly rejected. And this highlights a very important aspect in immunology. That is, the first time when you meet an antigen, you mobilize a response of a moderate intensity. It takes some time to come up. But if you give the same antigen a second time, then the organism reacts much more promptly and much more pronouncedly, much stronger reaction, as you can see here. And uh, so this is what we call a primary and a secondary antibody spot. And this held also for uh, transplantation. So yes, it was an immuno immunological reaction. But then Medawar noticed Burnett's writing and he realized, let's see if we can prove that Burnett is right. He used inbred mice for that purpose. You know, inbred mice are like identical twins. And so if you take just some white mice and some black mice, you took cells from the black mice and 
and injected out into the fetus of a pregnant white mice. And then they could show by this experimental construct that one could induce tolerance. And now one could take the black skin and move it to a, the skin of a white mice, and it survived and it thrived. So tolerance had been induced. And this is the reason why in 1960, Burnett and Medawar together received a prize for immunological tolerance. Now, Peter Medawar is another fantastic biological ph philosopher and a writer. So to use young people in the audience, I recommend you to write this book because it's still as relevant as it was when it was written back in the 1970s, advice to a young scientist. Now, we still have this very big question, namely, how is it possible for a body to mobilize an antibody response to a lot of different antigens, essentially any antigen? And uh, we had this idea that Eilish had maybe the antigen can instruct or stimulate uh, the body to produce an antibody, but it's very difficult to biologically comprehend how that would work. Now, Burnett, being an immunological thinker, he had an answer to this also. In fact, when he got this Nobel Prize, he said that I only got this prize for the second best thing I did in immunology, because I did something else in immunology. And what was that? Well, that was a theory that has a much more biological background, and it was it related to some observation that Nils Jern had did in the mid-50s. Mid he, uh, actually looking at immunization with certain bacterial virus, bacterial phages, and he thought he saw sometimes antibodies that were existing before he immunized. How could that happen? Why, why should that be? And built on this, and, and, amplify, and Burnett amplified this, because Burnett had a full understanding that one of the most essential things in biology is what on the surface of the cell, what are the receptors. And he built up a theory and said that, I think that the immune response is a clonal antibody response. So fundamentally, here is, for some reason, a lot of cells that can produce antibodies against various different structures, in comes an antigen, and there happened to be one clone here which actually fits. So this antigen will stimulate those cells by reacting with the receptors, and they will expand, so have a clonal expansion. Now, this is something completely different from what, what Ehrlich had said, because it means that it's not an instructive, it's not a Lamarckian mechanism, it is a selective Darwinian mechanism. Now, this is very, very fundamental uh, to appreciate. But, but it means also that in some way, our body can generate an enormous range of antibody-producing cells. And we'll come back to how that uh, works. But before discussing that, we needed to know a little bit what are antibodies built up by? What is, what is chemi chemistry? And, uh, that chemistry was revealed by these two Nobel laureates, Edelman and Porter, who got the prize in 1972. And without dwelling for too long time on that, this is a structure of the most common form of antibodies. And it has two long protein chains, the heavy chains, two light chains. It has an anti antigen binding site, which is a combination of structures in the two chains. And it, has, it happened to be bivalent. There are some other antibodies that are multivalent and so forth. So here is the, the, the variable part, and that is what the explanation for how we can react with many different uh, antigens. Before I discuss the mechanism for that, there is one more step to it, namely, we have diversity, we have uh, specificity, but we also have sensitivity in the immunological system. In the mid-1930s, it was demonstrated that you could, in fact, generate isotopes of essentially any chemical compound. That opened up a fantastic field, and we all, in our work, depending on the use of isotopes. 
And uh, a prize was given to that in chemistry in 1944 to George de Hevesy. That gave the discipline radiobiology or radiomedicine. So isotopes could be used, and Rosalind Yalov, she used isotopes. And you heard about uh, insulin and diabetes recently. So she labeled insulin with iodine, and the idea at the time was that uh, in patients with uh, diabetes who were giving insulin substitution, that the insulin was breaking down more quickly than under normal conditions, and that's why it didn't work so well. She found something very different. She found insulin it does not disappear more rapidly. It stays longer in those that have received substitute insulin. Why was that? Well, she found that the insulin was complex to what she found out was an antibody. So it was an anti and antibody complex. And then she tried to publish this, and the reviewers said, no way, no way. They rejected that paper. And the reason they rejected it is, again, it was one of those dogmas at the time. Insulin is a relatively small molecule, only about 6,000 molecular weight. And they, at the time, I thought that that's too small a protein to use an antibody response. So the paper was re rejected, and this apparently stayed with Rosalind Jalov through her life, because when she gave a Nobel lecture, she showed a copy of the letter of rejection. <laughs> so, but don't worry, if you get the paper rejected and you believe you're doing the right thing, just stay with it. And uh, so she developed, based on this labeled antigen, an radioimmunoassay. And that radioimmunoassay turned out to be enormously sensitive. It's like you take a lump of sugar and drop it in Lake Erie. You'll detect that sugar. That's about the sensitivity of this assay. So that's the as sensitivity aspect. I'll go even further way back to Arne Tiselius, one of our Swedish Nobel laureates. What did he do? He developed a very simple, straightforward technique of separating proteins by use of their charge. And uh, the material he preferred to use was our serum proteins. And what did he find then? Well, of course, it's a lot of albumin, but here was something called, they called gamma. It's actually, it's a broad band of proteins that migrate at different speeds. That is the fraction that contains the antibodies. But since there's a lot of different antibodies, that's not the single band, there's a thousands and thousands of different proteins there, and they form this rather homogeneous uh, uh, <coughs> distribution. Now, the uh, the cells that produce the antibodies, the, the, the so later called the B cells, they cannot get access to all parts of the body. They have, among other things, we have something called the blood-brain barrier. So immune cells do not get readily into the brain. It, it, it's difficult for them to get in there. And therefore, the number of cells in the brain that can react to an anti stimulation are much fewer than what they are in the periphery of the body. And this had, has a consequence, uh, and we were studying a persistent measles virus infection in the brain, and we looked at the immune response, and the immune response was not, this is just the gamma globulin region, it was not the normal smear that you should have with a lot, a lot of proteins. It was isolated bands. And because of that, it's called oligoclonal IG. Oligo means just a few, so there were just a few clones. And what we did was simply to look for various measles virus antibodies, and it, you can't see it here in this uh, reproduction because of the fastener, but we saw an uneven distribution of antibodies against different components of virus, and we said probably different bands are carrying different antibody specificities. And of course the dream was, think about it, if one could get a cell, or I can isolate a single cell from the immune system that produced a single antibody. And it, at the time, it appeared like a pipe dream. However, just a year later, 1975, there was a publication in Nature by Köhler and Milstein. And then I developed a technique that allowed you to produce monoclonal antibodies. Very simple technique, but very clever. So you hyperimmunize a mouse, and you take out the lymphocytes, and then you have a, a myeloma, which is a tumor in the B cells. 
But this myeloma has been selected not to produce any immunoglobulins longer, but it's just had the tumor cell characteristics of, of immo immortality and to be able to divide. And now what they did was simply to fuse these two cells and you get a hybridoma and all by a sudden you had clones of B cells, of immune cells, producing a single antibody. And this tool has um, fantastic application. Of course, in, in my field in virology, we could use it to characterize, uh, again, studying measles virus, five different components. And because the antibody is specific, it just picks out one component or another component. And you could have many antibodies to one component. You could compare them and you could map them. And it absolutely opened up fantastic possibilities. Köhler and Milstein never patented their uh, contribution of, of the hybridomas. So I, think, I don't think you should argue that, that it is greed that drives scientists. It's something else, it's the curiosity. Uh, but their contribution to science was just immense. So the big problem, how on earth can we produce antibodies to essentially anything that we meet? I mean, we have no idea what we're going to meet in, in our life, I mean, various infectious agents or what have you. Uh, and uh, this is the person that eventually demonstrated how this was possible. And then should keep in mind, as you've heard this morning, we have only 20 to 22,000 genes, and uh, although there's still some variation of that, but we're talking about millions and millions of different specificities. How can it be achieved? And uh, I doubt you can see much uh, with this rep reproduction, but I'll tell you very simply how it works. It's called combinatorial diversification. So there are different parts of the gene that eventually produced the uh, immunoglobulin proteins. And they are in, by some genetic mechanisms, they are multiplied, so they occur in several different numbers, maybe 10 or maybe 40 or something like that. Several different regions that are, 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 are amplified to occur in, in, with different characteristics. And then they are put together in a random fashion, so it's like a lottery, and the, the, the junctions are not exact either. And uh, together, these using different parts, different combinations, deriving it from both the two chains, all by sudden gives, like in a zip code or in a lottery, an endless number of variations. And this is what's called combinatorics or combinatorial diversification. And that's the way our immune system uh, works. And so it means that, yes, we have a potential to, uh, con to identify any kind of antigen. And let me then emphasize then again that it, 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 the, the really the key aspect of this, because there's one more aspect to this, and that is that, so the first time you meet an antigen that you've never seen before, fortunately there is some immune cell that can combine with that, and maybe it's not a perfect fit, but it's relatively loose, but it's enough to stimulate that cell to divide. But that cell does not only divide, there's also a trigger for hypermutation in that particular clone. So as the clone develops, it has a lot of subclones, and some of those, they fit much, much better with the antigen. So therefore, the secondary response here, there has been an evolutionary selection of, a, of clones here, so it's a much, much better fit when this clone reacts here, and that's why you get a stronger response and a much more rapid response. So here is evolution in action, really, the, what happens in this phase. So I want to, to give you kind of two forms of take-home lessons here. And uh, one is that in nature, even with a limited number of genes, there are possibilities to generate an endless number of variants if you do some form of combinatorics. But the other is, whenever you think about a biological problem, you should do it in the perspective of evolution. 
And here is, I think, intellectually and conceptually somewhat of a difference because the human mind is more of the technological mind. When you as technologists here would like to construct something, you want to save energy to do it as efficient as possible, make sure there is very little waste. Not so in nature. Nature works with an enormous waste. The immune system is a grand example of this because, so again, in our body, we can produce antibodies against essentially any kind of antigen, but we're only using a fraction of a per mil of that. Most of these antibodies are of no use. They will never be used, but it's the only way to construct a system in an evolutionary perspective. And so nature is very wasteful, which sometimes, just look at the excesses of spring. Or for each one of you, think about it. You are the product of a fertilization with the one sperm and the one egg. And that single sperm has outcompeted 50 million other sperms. And at least according to our children and grandchildren, it's the greatest race that they have ever won. I mean, and they're very happy about it. I mean, it's, so it it's, seems like a waste, but there are reasons for these large numbers, and they really, really uh, give the, the, the fundament for, for optimizing the system. Now, today we can study this interaction between antigen and antibodies by use of crystallography. So we can really, we can see the antibody, we can see the antigen. And this is just to give you an, an illustration. This is a poliovirus particle. And here is the IgG antibodies. And I used it on the cover of a popularized book that I wrote in Sweden on our viruses. Because it, it really catches a lot in just the one figure. Now, poliovirus, there are three strains of poliovirus. They are antigenically stable. So it is these antibodies that really allows you, when you are vaccinated against polio, to uh, make sure that you cannot become infected. And this is one of the most successful vaccines ever, and was one of the most scaring diseases. I mean, most of you are too young to ever know that there was something called polio. But in the first part of the 20th century, this was the number one threat because one didn't know how it spread, and one couldn't control it. And of course, we gave a Nobel Prize in 1954 to Anders Weller and Robbins, in which they managed to grow poliovirus in cells so that one could produce the vaccine. And today, we're trying actually to eradicate this disease from the world. Uh, quite a tall order, one come a long way. So uh, today, there are only three countries in the world that still have what is called endogenous polio, it's Nigeria down in, in Africa, and it's Afghanistan and Pakistan. India, surprisingly, during the last two years, had been essentially without a single case of polio, a population of one billion people. Now, not all viruses are antigenically stable, but fortunately, most of them are. And that's the reason why we've been so successful in our use of vaccines. Think about it. I mean, we, we use this vaccine, and thereby we arrange for people never to be, be, be infected with, a, with various viruses. What, what a relief that is. And, I mean, and then people just take it for granted today. But childhood diseases, measles, mumps, rubella, and you name it, uh, there's all these vaccines. So you would say, well, a smart virus, a really smart virus, it should have some mechanism by which it could circumvent the immune response by changing its antigenic character. And some viruses have that uh, property. One of them is influenza virus. Uh, and so each year, the virus is changing its character, so the immune response that we mobilized the previous year is not fully effective, and we have to develop a new vaccine and a new vaccine and so forth. And uh, so that is another challenge. And here is, uh, what I might say, then quite a, a clever virus because it managed to, to circumvent the uh, uh, specific immune response. But uh, I show this slide that I got from Ian Wilson at the Scripps Research Institute just to illustrate that one is looking out for various sites. Here, no, I should emphasize that. 
This is not the whole virus particle. This is one of the surface structure of the influenza virus. It's a trimere, something called the hemagglutinin. Here are antibodies attacking different sites. We can study individual sites of attack now, and some of them are more cross-reactive than others. So the, the idea behind this is that maybe one can produce a vaccine that has broader reactivity than the narrow one that we normally have. And let me finish with simply telling you my, my main engagement at the present time is to, to review the history of science by use of Nobel Prizes. And you do need to have some patience because we have a 50-year secrecy. But the 50-year secrecy allow you to look now at the price in 1960 and 61. And in January next year, I can look at Watson and Crick's. Why do you do these things? Well, when you describe how it all has evolved, you, you, you have in the archives a unique real-time evaluation of science, the way it was looked at at that time. And science is progressively being built up. I would argue that uh, science is the, the, the factor of greatest importance for the development of our civilization. Science and technology are the prime movers of our civilization. <clears throat> and therefore, the strength in that whole enterprise is that it aggregates. So you go from increasing the knowledge, expanding the knowledge, increase in the resolution and so forth all the time. And that process remains the same, namely human discovery, which is a unique creative process. And you, you, what you can hope when you describe the situation under which new knowledge is being gained is that you will learn a little about this human creativity, the individual and the environment. However, having said that, let me emphasize that science is not a predictable, uh, developed, predictable event. We can do, we can try to gather people, we can provide the conditions, but in the end, it's the individual that makes the difference. Very often, so I tell you, what, what is the reward in science? Well, the reward. It's not the monetary reward. It's something very uh, different. A, a part of, I would say, a part of the reward is the social context of science, the way you interact with your colleagues, the way you debate things, the way you encourage each other when, it, when you're blue, the way you join in, in the advance of, of your friend and so forth. It's a highly, highly social and, and committed thing. But it's also sometimes, but not very often, you make that major discovery and that moment, when you're looking at those data, realizing I'm the first and only one in this world who has seen this or understood this phenomenon, that is the reward. That was great science about. And then we often say that it, it's so beautiful. And that always beautiful. Very often you find that it, it, it's, a, it's a clever, simple solution to the whole thing. And therefore, in your own mind, you interpret as beautiful. And let me end with a quote by Lawrence Darrell, the author of the Alexandria Quartet, the, one of the working materials for Balthasar. He writes, science is the poetry of the intellect. Thank you so much for your attention.